ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೋ ಘನತು ಸಹವೀರ್ಯಂಕರವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ವಾಸುದೇವೇಂದ್ರಯೋಗೀಂದ್ರ ಜ್ಞಾನಪ್ರದ ಗುರು ಮುಕ್ಷೂಣಿತೋಧೋಧೀಯತೆ the last of the samadhi shatka sampatti or the six fold inner wealth was samadhanam which was explained as chitta ekagrata this single pointedness of the mind concentration of the mind or focus of the mind <coughs> it will happen when we cultivate the earlier qualities namely shama dama uparama what it is is various things that disturb my mind they are all dealt with shama is tranquility of the mind that is freedom from likes and dislikes impulses of raga dvesha or likes and dislikes dama is the control over the sense organs means control over the other impulse urges the natural or habitual urges in the mind titiksha is endurance which gives me also freedom from the reactions coming on account of the interaction with the world around me shraddha is that implicit faith or the trust and lack of shraddha when i don't have the trust then also there is resistance in my mind which is also a disturbance so all of these qualities that have been described they remove one or the other sources of distraction or disturbance in my mind so as these qualities are cultivated we will find our mind becoming focused abiding more and more free from distractions and restlessness <clears throat> so in that sense also there is a certain, there is a reason for this there is a sequence there is an order that it starts with shama the control over the mind and then comes dama the control over sense organs although sometimes is you start with dama the control of sense organs there is most external easier then control of the mind then uparama and then that gives me the ability to endure what is going on also creates in me shraddha and bring the mar samadhan <coughs> so it's it this is very important not only for study of vedanta but for our day to day life also this quality is described as samadhi shatka sampatti is very important just to be able to be happy in our life <coughs> see vedanta talks about a vedantin is neither happy nor unhappy what is that is neither happy nor unhappy <coughs> so understand that and we will have a chance to talk about it about the disposition of mind but our mind is made up of these three dispositions or three gunas sattva rajas and tamas sattva is tranquility or serenity rajas is agitation and tamas is dullness so these three moods in fact make up our mind at any given time our mind is either sattvic or rajas or tamas that either the mind is tranquil or serene contemplative reflective learning or mind is agitated reacting seeking demanding desiring or the mind is dull so at any one time one of these dispositions usually prevails in our mind now when we say that 
we are seeking freedom from happiness and unhappiness, we are seeking freedom from reactions. If happiness is a reaction to something, or unhappiness is a reaction to something, when we say that we seek to become free from harsha and shoka, elation and depression, meaning become free from these reactions, that's all. So what we call happiness, or what we call harsha or elation, that comes because something desirable happens. So today in New York Times, the front page, there is a, uh, a picture. Somebody somewhere won this, uh, I forget his name, the golf tournament. And his fans, in his hometown or some place where they are all watching that and you can see the elation, the, the man he won. That he may have been happy, whatever, these fellows, you can see, you know, everybody is just elated, highly elated. This is called harsha, elation. That comes as a reaction to something that is desirable. If that did not happen, the same people have been depressed also with the same intensity because they did not get what they want. So, this elation and depression both are reactions. What we want is a non-reacting mind. So what we mean by happiness, a joy, is freedom from elation and depression when the mind is sattvic, then the mind is cheerful. So what we are seeking is cheerfulness, joy or happiness that comes with freedom and not mixed with dependence. When I am happy because something happens, then the happiness is endowed with dependence and also with bondage because I am dependent. And what happens with that kind of happiness is that usually my mind wants more and more of it. So if I become happy because I have a salary of $50,000, I am very happy. After a year or so, then I want 55000 Then after two years, I want 75. Then all because this is how the mind becomes addicted when it depends upon the happenings and objects for its happiness and it is not only dependent, becomes addicted and the law of diminishing return is always acting. And therefore you need more and more in order to make you happy. Like one cigarette may be enough when it begins. Then two, then three, then five and the whole pack. And then most soon before you realize you find that it is no more giving you happiness but without that you become miserable. So understand that the happiness that is coming from any sense objects or anything other than ourselves is a binding happiness. It is only a, merely an appearance of happiness. What we want is an abiding happiness. And that is when it comes from ourself. So sattva means happiness that comes from my own self, which is accompanied with freedom. There is no elation there. But there is tranquility. So, this is what we are seeking, tranquility. So, there is no excitement in this. But excitement means it's harsh, elation, which is likely to be accompanied with depression. What we want is the serenity, the, the joy, the cheerfulness that comes from our own self. And that is where the freedom is because then I am dependent upon nothing. I am the source of happiness. And ultimately that process culminates into discovering that happiness I am, not source of happiness, I am happiness. And therefore, it is not that a Vedantin is not happy. When you interpret the teaching of Vedanta as neither happy nor unhappy, it looks like he must be very dull. It must be very boring. No, in fact, he's composed. He's cheerful. He's happy. Happy. He's he is he's, he's he's enjoying himself. He's enjoying everything. So there is joy. So if you want to use different words, then you can wor use the word pleasure for the happiness that comes from objects and other things. And you can use the word joy for the happiness that comes from within ourselves. It's a matter of using the words. And so that. 
what we want to give up is not even happiness. We want to give up the dependence. What we want to become is free or independent. And independent even in my happiness. I, dem- I can command my happiness rather than my happiness being a chance event depending upon some desirable happening which I cannot control. So understand that a Vedanta is a happy person. You may not see an excitement and things like that, which are all short-lived and, and which leave ultimately a, uh, uh, you know, a period wherein there is a, uh, like a hangover, like a withdrawal or whatever, so devoid of that. <clears throat> okay, so, thus, in cultivating the sixfold inner wealth that we discussed, as I said, you progressively discover that satisfaction, contentment within your own self. So this is a rewarding process. And therefore, it is something to be practiced by everybody. Whoever wants to be happy or successful should practice this. If it is clear in my mind, it is clear that happiness can only come from consciousness or self and not from anything else. And all I need to do is to to remove the obstacles which stifle that happiness and just bring the happiness to manifestation, the natural manifestation. <clears throat> now we come to the fourth qualification. We read on the page 10. Mumukshutvam kim Moksha me bhuyad Idi icha the disciple asks, Mumukshuttam Kim. What is Mumukshuttam? Sir, you talked about the fourfold qualification. Viveka, Vairagya, Samadhi, Shatka, Sampattihi, Mumukshuttam. So you have delineated the first three. Please tell me what Mumukshuttam means. So the teacher explains, Moksha me bhuyat iricha, the desire. May I have liberation? That's all. The desire is called, is a fourth qualification. <clears throat> so, the desire, let me have liberation. Let me have freedom. A, a, a keen desire, a strong desire for freedom or liberation. Meaning, that desire which is the exclusion of every other desire. I do not want anything but freedom. Not just desire for freedom, but then when all the desires have reduced to one desire and that is desire for freedom. But better than that, as Vivek Chodamani explains, Mumukshatvam, Ahankara Dehantan, Pandhan Ajnana Kalpitan, Svasvarupava Bodhena, Mukta Micha Mumukshata. This Mumukshata, Mumukshatvam, or this desire for liberation is explained like this. Svasarupava bodhena, by the knowledge of one's own nature, mukta micha, becoming free from ahankara dehantan mandhan. So, becoming free from the bondage, beginning from the ego all the way up to my body, beginning free from this bondage by the knowledge of myself. So simple desire of freedom should get transformed into the desire for knowledge. Therefore, although it is called mumuksha, it should be called jignasa. Jignasa means desire for knowledge. So this is what we call the maturity when a person recognizes that freedom can be obtained by knowledge. So far there was an attempt to become free I wanted to become free because I took myself to the bound and I, I, I thought that I need to do something to become free. And so whatever I did, I acquired a lot of things. I acquired wealth, name, fame, all kinds of things I acquired to become free. But as a consequence of cultivating these qualities, now there is my mind discerns as to what is this freedom? As we discussed in the morning, what do I want? Recognition that I want limitless, I want to be totally free. 
not only do I want to be free, but I do not want any conditions attached to my freedom, I want to be unconditionally free. Not only do I want to be happy, but unconditionally happy. Understand what is meant by unconditional happiness? We can understand that when we examine any experience of happiness. Suppose you won the lottery, it's a you know, wonderful thing, and you are ecstatic, you are elated. But again, this happiness also is conditional happiness. It is subject to condition that a lottery must be won. And subject to condition that, that million dollars which I won should continue to fascinate me forever. Unfortunately, that million dollar also which fascinates me now because now I am just hundred dollars in my pocket and a million dollars I got is fantastic. But how long is it going to keep me excited? For some time. Then you get used to the idea that you are a millionaire. It no more gives you excitement. If the happiness depends upon excitement, then things have a very limited capacity to give me excitement. And then they lose their capacity. As we said, the law of diminishing return. And so then again, I find myself desiring another million. And that gives me excitement for some time. Then I find myself desiring yet another million. So when we examine the nature of happiness that we get from anything, whether it is from this kind of achievement, whether it is from some recognition, fame, name, whatever, all that happiness is conditional as much as it comes only when a given condition is satisfied and it remains only as long as that condition is satisfied. As long as that thing continues to inspire me or so far I am happy, when it ceases to inspire me, it is no capacity to give me happiness. These are our experience, the best things in our life. I just was looking forward to this car, when am I going to get this, whatever the car is, you know, whether it is Lexus or Porsche or whatever, it's just working for it. Took me five years to save enough money so I can buy it. Finally I had it. Oh, like an 18 year old boy, you know, that on the 18th birthday, now I can drive, I must have such and such sports car, okay. He's behind the wheels, he's in heavens. How long? Six months? A year? How long? Anything has a limit to the extent of excitement that it can give us. And ultimately you are back where you were. This is our experience. And I don't want this. Therefore, Arjuna asks of Lord Krishna, Yashreyasya nishchitam bruhitan me. O oh Lord, please tell me that by which I can achieve nishchitam shreya. I can attain that happiness once and for all. I want the happiness that never goes and I do not want unhappiness never to come. I have achieved, Arjuna knows, he has achieved so much in his life. And, and still he has always remained a desire. As a desire does not go. So, what is the basic desire? To become free from the desire. So, when this understanding comes, that is called maturity. The desire behind all desires is to become free from desire because desire itself is a sign of bondage. It is a sign of limitation. A sign of dependence. And where is that unconditional freedom? It is my own self. And therefore, it is by knowledge of the nature of true nature of myself that I can gain that freedom, that understanding. Then the whole pursuit now gets transformed into the pursuit of knowledge. That's Mumukshutta. Mumukshutta is a person who is not only keen, who has a keen desire for liberation, but also has this maturity or understanding that liberation that I want, freedom that I want, success that I want, or happiness that I want, can only be by knowledge that I am that happiness or I am that freedom. It is knowledge of the self that can give me that happiness or success. When this understanding comes, this maturity comes, then the person is ready 
for knowledge. Who is the one qualifier for seeking knowledge? One who has desire for knowledge, that's all. So what's the qualification? Understand what qualification Vedanta talks about. He doesn't say the person should be a man or a woman, he has not said here. Or a Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, an American, is dark, black, fair, no such qualification. Tall, short, nothing. What's the qualification? Just desire for knowledge. So the fourth qualification is the culmination of the first three qualifications. When we have that viveka or discrimination, which gives rise to vairagya or dispassion, which gives rise to the sixfold inner wells, then that culminates into desire for knowledge. So who is qualified for pursuit of knowledge? One who has desire for knowledge. Simple as that. So this fourth qualification, mumukshutam, is a desire. See, desire cannot be a qualification because I cannot will the desire. It's just, you know, we should pay attention to this. Here it's interesting that this text says that the fourth qualification, mumukshutam, is desire for liberation. Now, how can desire be a qualification? Because I cannot cultivate desire. I can cultivate qualities, but desire I cannot will. Desire is something that happens in our minds. I don't know what desire next will arise in my mind. It just will arise by itself. So how can it, How can they say that the desire for liberation is a qualification? So what it means is that I must achieve that disposition of mind where this desire automatically happens. So desire that happens in our mind is determined by the disposition of our mind. If the mind is sattvic, there will be desire for knowledge. If mind is rajas, then there will be desire for enjoyment of pleasure. If mind is tamas, there will be desire for sleep, inactivity. <clears throat> so as a result of a process of getting sattvic mind, shuddhan tahkarana, a purified mind, a purified self, there arises desire for knowledge. That's what Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Sattvat Sanjayate Jnanam. When there is sattva in our mind, there arises knowledge, first desire for knowledge, and then knowledge. <coughs> so, but the keen desire, not just a desire, not one of those desires. One of the desires we have, but it should become the only desire. Just to give the example, like this person cultivating fish in the pond in his backyard. And this is the kind of fish where the bigger fish eats the smaller fish. And that in turn is eaten by a bigger fish, eaten by yet another bigger fish. How many fish will it leave? Just one. And who will eat that? The fisherman will eat that one. Similarly, every big desire swallows a smaller desire. And that is swallowed by yet another desire. And ultimately, only one desire will be left. What is that? Mamukshatvam, moksha me bhuyat. May I have keen desire, may I, have, may I be liberated. I do not want anything else. And that's the only desire that we can fulfill. No other desire can really be fulfilled. When we fulfill our desires, it is just, it is merely an, an illusion on my part that my desire is fulfilled. Because desire behind every desire is only that for happiness or freedom. And therefore, there's one desire that can be fulfilled by knowledge. So, mumukshatvam. That keenness of desire, they, they sometimes give an example. This is a very well-known event. Or, 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 or event that is described with reference to Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. That one devotee asked Ramakrishna Paramahamsa that... I want to I want to see God. Can you show me God? So no reply was given at that time. After in some in a few days an occasion arose when this devotee went for a bath into the river with Ram Krishna. So Ganga is flowing right there. So when that fellow took a dip inside, what Ram Krishna did is he pressed his head inside. <clears throat> in the water 
and that fellow got suffocated and he struggled hard and he came up and he says what are you doing do you realize that i would have died you know are you you want to kill me or what he says no i don't I didn't want to kill you but when your head was pressed in water what did you feel what do you mean what did i feel there's only one thing how many can i get out it's okay if you desire to know god becomes that king you will definitely see him in vedantic text they give another example and the example of a uh, a man or a sadhu with matted locks and suppose for some reason this spark falls in his head in his hair and his hair catches fire he runs he runs for a pool of water so he can plunge into water and can and quench this fire so he is running for pool of what desire does he only one desire i want to plunge into water no other desire at all when he is running to the pool of water that time hey swami ji here is a candy ice cream you know because he loves that normally no forget it nothing can appeal to him at that time just one desire so they say that when the desire for freedom and liberation becomes that keen i don't want anything understand then nothing can distract my mind as long as other values are left it is possible that my mind may be distracted if still i have not become free from some fascinations for recognition for power for name fame they say that these subtle desires remain and you have to so deha vasana and then loka vasana shastra vasana this this subtle desires remain lord krishna says that you can create a distance with the objects of pleasure and that way you can remain free from their impact but the fascination you have for those objects doesn't go away unless you discover that satisfaction from your own self so this is how they say when the mind is preoccupied with just one desire i want to know and nothing else <clears throat> and many such students are described in upanishads like nachiketa is one of those students in katha upanishad story of nachiketa when he asks for self knowledge of lord death of yamaraja and yamaraja seeing this young boy asking for self knowledge brahma vidya says them as are you serious does he know what he is asking for so he try to test him nachiketa forget it do you know that even devutas also have always had doubts about this knowledge it is so difficult it is so subtle therefore give up this desire for self knowledge ask for something else nachiketa says if the devutas also had doubts and they also had difficulty in knowing then i definitely want to know because it is very precious so i don't want anything else the young raja want to tempt him with all kinds of temptation nachiketa have as many sons as you want grandsons you want there is a value those days sons and grandsons have sons who will live 100 years and grandsons who will live 100 years and ask for as much as gold and, and horses and cattle elephants gold precious stones ask for as long a life as you want i'll make you the king of the whole earth take it but don't ask for the self knowledge just to see whether he can get tempted or not and he just did not get tempted at all he says keep all these things with you keep your vehicles and your dance and your instruments keep them with you i don't want them these are all perishable there is no guarantee that they'll be there tomorrow or not i want the imperishable very clear so when this clarity is there then alone mind does not get distracted in anything otherwise it get distracted with little things therefore we should settle all our accounts as far as various desires are concerned as far as various uh, aspirations are concerned ambitions are concerned if you cannot resolve them then you better go through it fulfill those ambitions fulfill those desires experience those things and then now you are clear what it means then 
the mind will not be distracted. Otherwise, uh, intellectually it is one thing, experientially something else. So here we are talking about an emotionally mature person who has very, he has a great clarity as to what he wants and the means also of how to acquire that and that is knowledge. So transformation from a mumukshuru jignyasu. So desire of no, freedom becomes desire of knowledge and we recognize that freedom is, has to be my nature and I have to know what it is. <coughs> so thus, this is the fourfold qualification, sadhana. So concluding this, the next sentence is, etat sadhana chatushtayam. So this is the fourfold sadhana. Fourfold means fourfold qualifications. <coughs> what happens as a result of acquiring this qualification? The next sentence is, Tatah Tatvavekasya Adhikarino Bhavanti Thereafter, or consequently, they become qualified persons for the discriminative knowledge of the truths. So, when these qualifications are there, one becomes most excellently qualified for the pursuit of knowledge and gaining the knowledge. <clears throat> but this is rare. This kind of adhikari, this kind of qualified student is a rare thing, you know. There are some nasikata somewhere, or it's not a very common phenomenon to have people possessing these qualifications. But at the same time, we should know that each one of us possesses these qualifications in one measure or the other. We have viveka, or dis- we have the capacity to discern and we always use it. We always analyze and ask ourselves, is it beneficial to me or not? Is it right or not? Is it worthwhile or not? Just all the time I do make choices. So I have the capacity to discriminate, capacity to discern. All we need to do is to cultivate that capacity so that ultimately we can discriminate between the Nitya and Nitya, the eternal and ephemeral. Vairagya, dispassion also we have. Vairagya, growing out of something. Like as we said, as a child, I was so much attached to my toys. When I grew up, when I grew old, well, okay, toys are there, it's fine. They're not there, so we're all toy Vairagya. You know, we all have renunciates with reference to toys with reference to marbles, with reference to many such things. Each one of us is renunciate. We have vairagya. Not that we know what vairagya is. We know what renunciation is. When its presence or absence does not affect me. When I am comfortable when it is there, comfortable when it is not there. That relationship is called vairagya. And we have vairagya or dispassion or renunciation with reference to many things. So as you said, we all marble renunciates, you know, marble sannyasis, toy sannyasis, and various other things, bicycle sannyasis, scooter sannyasis. Idea is that when you get a superior thing, automatically you become renunciated with reference to the low inferior things. So as in our life we discover better and better things, automatically fascination for the little things drops off. And thus we know that the vairagya or renunciation is a process of growth. And to the extent that we discover better things, automatically our attachment for the smaller things drops off. We have to cultivate that process. To ultimately discover vairagya or renunciation for every kind of pleasure. Right now, I have vairagya for many things. Formerly James Bond, Perry Mason, this is the kind of thing that one was reading. Then you came, or Agatha Christie. Then you came across some better literature. Then you came across uh, Vedanta. Then you came across uh, Upanishads. 
So as you come across superior and superior things automatically, now it, the thought never occurs to read James Bond. It never occurs to me. I, I don't hate it, it's fine. But then I don't need it. Become free, becoming free from need. So we have Vairagya. It is our experience that as we cultivate something better, our fascination or attachment for something lower drops off. This process should continue until I become free from every kind of attachment. It can happen because we know what it is. We have Shama, Dhamma, Upar, all those qualities we have. We do enjoy tranquility of mind now and then. We do have enjoy self-control also. When we have value, then we enjoy self-control. Not that we don't. We don't always fall for our mind or our urges. I know that when the examination time came, just one month to, for examination, then you can't, because in India, only one examination, annual examination. And you don't study hard for the whole year. And when the last few months, then you start working hard. And one month, then you know, you, you, you are not, even revision is not over, this is not done. And so you just enclose yourself in just one room, nothing else, no TV, no movies, nothing. Become a sannyasi for one month. So then we know what self-control is. When there is a value that I must pass this test and I must score this, then when the value is there, I am able to exercise that discipline. So we have, we know what discipline is, we know what Dhamma is. Tritiksha, we, we tolerate, many, we endure many things, we endure. When you go out for a pilgrimage or, or a trekking, or, you know, you endure a lot of things. Go to the mountains and it is... Sometimes it is very cold, sometimes it is hot, a lot of discomfort and a lot of exertion. We endure because we have value for it. I am not obliging anybody, I enjoy that process of enduring as a matter of fact. So endurance also we have. Shraddha also we have. Each one of us has this Shraddha. As you said, there is a lot of trust or Shraddha involved. Every time I ride the aeroplane, a lot of Shraddha that the pilot will take me. Every time I sit in a bus or wherever, anywhere, even a car, Shraddha, that will reach safely. When you get up from here and step down, Shraddha, that I'll be able to stand on my legs, that I will not fall down. So we have Shraddha. Thus we all have all of these qualities in us. So Vedanta is not asking us to cultivate something new. It is always praptasya prapti, attainment of what is already there. It's all there within us. We just have to bring it to manifestation. That's all. Iksamadhanam. Even concentration also I have in things that I am interested in. So all these qualifications we have in some measure or the other. And these capacities we have, we have to cultivate these capacities. <coughs> and Viveka Chodamani says that of all these, Viveka Chodamani identifies two things. Vairagyam cha mumukshutvam tivram yasyatu vidyate. Vairagya and mumukshutvam, the dispassion and the keen desire for knowledge. When you find, you have, then understand that rest of the qualifications are there. So pay attention to dispassion and pay attention to the value for knowledge. When knowledge becomes valuable to me and becomes most valuable to me, so more valuable knowledge becomes more dedicated I am going to be because I am always devoted to that which is most important in my life. If knowledge is most important in my life, I will find devotion for it. <coughs> and so we will discover that. Tataha tattva vekasya adhikarana bhavanti As a result of gaining these qualifications, they become adhikarana. They become qualified persons to discriminate between you know, the self and non-self. <clears throat> so this is comparable to the first sutra of Brahma Sutra. We have a text called Brahma Sutra, which again is a great treatise on Vedanta only. Very elaborate treatise. The first statement or aphorism is Athato Brahma Jignasa. Atha thereafter, Ataha therefore, Brahma Jignasa, the desire to know Brahma. Thereafter, when these qualifications are cultivated, there will be desire to know. So desire to know will automatically arise when the mind has become sattvic. 
Therefore, this qualification, Atha, thereafter, having acquired these qualifications, having lived a life wherein we gain that emotional maturity, having lived a life of yoga. So, karma yoga is meant to cultivate this qualification. Lord Krishna teaches karma yoga in Bhagavad Gita to cultivate these qualifications. <coughs> because jnanam is the third section, karma, coupled with bhakti, leads to the desire for knowledge and, and talks about jnanam. Brahma jignasa means Brahma vichara kartavya, then one should investigate or deliberate upon the nature of Brahman with the help of Upanishads. So, first sutra, Brahma sutra is explained here so far. And then, rest of Brahma sutra is explained in the subsequent text, in its own way. So, as we say, texts such as this Tattva Bodha are treaties that give us an overview of the, of all the Vedanta principles. So, teacher made a statement that, Thereafter now they become qualified students for Tattva Viveka, for the knowledge of the truth. So then the next question is, what is that Tattva Viveka? So every time a statement is made, there is something new and therefore the student then wants to know, what is that? Answer is given, there is yet another question, what is that? That answer is given, yet another question. That's how an unfoldment is going on. So there is a very beautiful unfoldment of these Whole, whole scripture is done here. So, next question. Tattva viveka kaha Atma satyam Tadanyat sarvam Mithya iti So, teacher says thereafter you become qualified for Tattva viveka for discriminative knowledge of truth. What is Tattva Veka? What is the discriminated knowledge of truth? <coughs> so, answer is given. Now, discrimination. Atma Satyam Tadanyas Saram Mithya. So, what do we need to separate? Discrimination is separation. Separating what from what? Satya and Mithya. Earlier also it was said that Ekam Nityam Ekam Vastu Nityam Tad Brahma. Only Brahma is Nitya, Tadanya Saram Anitya, Tad Vidiriktam Saram Anityam. Earlier I said that Brahma is Nitya, everything else is Anitya. Now the teacher uses different words. Atma is Satyam, everything else is Mithya. So earlier I said Brahma is Nitya, everything else is Anitya. Brahma is eternal, everything else is perishable. Here he said now Atma is Satyam, to the nyasara mithya, atma is truth, everything else is mithya. Apparent. <coughs> so question, what is truth? Atma is truth. <coughs> See, what is the definition of truth? How does Vedanta define truth? So what is absolute truth, Swamiji? Or what is truth? Truth is absolute. So truth is defined in a very simple way. Abhaditam satyam. That which cannot be negated is called truth. Or that which does not change in time, place or condition is called truth. So there is truth in this life. Sometimes the question is there. Is there anything called truth? Is there anything eternal? Is there anything changeless? In fact the Baudas don't accept that. Gautam Buddha said, Sarvam Kshanikam, Sarvam Dukkham Dukkham, Sarvam Kshanikam Kshanikam. Everything is momentary. Everything is changing. There is no such thing as changeless. Vedanta says, no, there is changeless. The fact that you are able to see the change. In fact, the change can be measured or change can be recognized only with reference to something that does not change. We can recognize the movement from one point to the other only with reference to a point which is a fixed point. So fact that you say that the world is changing. For me to say that the world is changing, I must be aware of something that does not change, understand? For me to say that the world is, etern- is, is ephemeral, I must be aware of that which is eternal. We already know changeless. 
Meaning we already experience eternal, we already experience changes in light of which we say that everything is changing. Do we experience changeless? Changeless? Do we experience eternal? So you said that whatever we experience is all changing, is all ephemeral. But for me to say that something is changing, there must be a reference which does not change. For me to say that the wheel is rotating, there was something that does not rotate, then only I can say it is rotating. Right now we are all rotating around the sun, but can we say that? Because everything is rotating, there is no reference point. So looking at the sun, we can say that we must be moving. If we accept sun as fixed, then we can say that we are moving. It's a reference point. So for us to say that the world is changing, you know, there must be a reference point that does not change. For us to say that everything is ephemeral or perishable, there must be something imperishable, which we must know, we must experience. What is that eternal? What is that changeless? With reference to which I say that everything is changing. Any idea? We can say that, yes, everything is changing some, yes, okay. Everything is perishable. But to say that this is all changing and perishable, there must be a reference point that does not change. Is there a reference point? It is my own self. Understand that I experience myself all the time because it is self effulgent and it's not that eternal is something that you go someplace to find out. It is right here. Then no, it can be called eternal. So that which is eternal, changeless, satyam of the truth is right here. If it does not change in time, place or condition must be at every time, every place, every condition. Right here and now. And that is the self, atma satyam. What is it that is non-negatable? <clears throat> you remember this? This, this conversation that our Swamiji had with one of the professors in Berkeley, when in many years ago Swamiji was giving these discourses there, and the title was Self-Knowledge. That was the title of the series of talks. So first day Swamiji uh, was talking about Satyam, the truth, and that is truth. And the talk was concluded by saying that I will define truth. And that's how it was left. So that people just, what is he going to say about it? So they will come next day. But then this professor of physics came to Swami. Swami, you said that you are going to define truth. Nobody can define truth. God defined is God defined. So how can you define? So yeah, I will define, come tomorrow. No, you tell me what is the definition. No, if I tell you now, you won't come tomorrow. No, no, I'll come tomorrow. Please tell me, what is it? Because he could not sleep that night. So that, that's why he came earlier, you know. Tell me. Okay. Our definition of... Because he was waiting for Swamiji to define truth so that he can find a fault with the definition. That's all. <clears throat> so Swamiji says, truth is that which cannot be negated. That came with a tremendous surprise. Truth is that which cannot be negated. It's all that went. So, uh, next day again he comes an, uh, an hour earlier than the lecture. He says, yeah, that's right. I could not shake, I, I, I thought about the whole night. Truth is that which cannot be negated. And I could not shake the definition. I see nothing, you know. I, I can't find any fault with the definition. Truth is that which cannot be negated. But is there such a thing? Yes, you wait for the lecture. I'll tell you. Is there such a thing? Oh, this is just a definition. The yeah, truth is that which cannot be negated. But is there such a thing that cannot be negated? There is. What is it? You come to the class. You tell me. I'll come. You please tell me. Well, the one who negates cannot be negated. The negator cannot be negated. The I cannot be negated. It is I that negates everything. But that cannot be negated. 
the self cannot be negated. For really, he was just amazed at this. And that's right. Because I can negate, drop everything. I can let go of everything. I have, what is meant by negation is that I can withdraw my mind from I can let go of something from my mind. And if I close all my organs of perception, the whole world is also let go from my mind. If I stop my mind of thoughts, emotions, everything is let go. I can make my mind completely empty, thoughtless, nothing is there. And still, one, one entity is left. And what is it? I, who is doing all that. The negator cannot be negated. Because for negation, somebody who negates is required. And so, there is only one thing that is non-negatable. If satyam is abhaditam, that which cannot be negated, that which cannot be falsified, that which cannot be changed, that which cannot be improved upon, there is one thing, atma or the self. So it says, atma satyam. Atma means I, meaning the word atma is I, that's all. What we call I. That is Atma. So that's Sanskrit word for I. I is Satyam, is truth, is non-negatable, is changeless. In all three periods of time, in all time, place and conditions. It is boundless, it is limitless. Because changeless must be not limited by time, therefore not limited by place. And therefore, it is free from limitation of time, place. Therefore, it is free from limitation. It is limitless, boundless. So, self is limitless, boundless, absolute truth. Tadanyat saram mithya. Everything other than that is mithya, is apparent. <clears throat> this is, so understand how Vedanta defines truth. Because there are other definitions of truth also available. We have a school of think, so thinkers called Nayayakas or the logicians. And they define truth. You know how they define truth? What is true? So Satyatam, Artha Kriya Karitvam Satyatam. That which serves the purpose, that which is true to its name is truth, they say. Thus, the water in my glass here is true because this substance which is in my glass is true to its name water. It can quench my thirst. It serves the purpose of water. Therefore, it is real. Then what is unreal? The mirage water. It looks like water but does not serve the purpose of water. Therefore, it is unreal. So, this is how they define what is true or real. That which is true to its name, that which serves the purpose. And that is how things that are apparent, things that are projected or subjective are all negated. In the rope snake or, or in the in case of water and mirage water, this water that we drink is according to them true or real, that other water is unreal. But Vedantin says that. How do you say that this water also serves the purpose? Even this water also serves the purpose under certain conditions. It does not serve the purpose unconditionally. I always keep a glass of water on the table beside the bed so that if I feel thirsty, I can drink. The other night I felt thirsty. When, you know, in my dream, I felt thirsty. I was so thirsty, looking for water everywhere, I could not find it. I felt that I did not have water for half a day. My, my throat was parching. And I, I just went, thank God that I woke up from that. I realized that I am okay. Then I saw that stupid glass of water. It was there. It was not useful to me. So you say that this, is called, this water is real, because it quenches the thirst, but it did not quench the thirst of the dreamer. I was thirsty in the dream, but this waking water was not available to me. So how do you say that it is always useful? Even the usefulness also is only conditional. In the waking state, these things are useful, not in the dream state. The dream objects are useful there, not in the waking state. 
Often I win lotteries in a dream. I wish that it was real. When I wake up, not a single penny in my pocket because it is an itya. So these are Vedantins dismiss the definition of truth given by the Nyayikas. They say that this is all real, this is all tangible, it's all useful. Why, so why do you go to the dining hall when you're hungry? If it's all mithya, then why do you eat food? They don't understand what mithya is. They think mithya means that which is not useful. Vedantin says that what is useful is mithya. Because the food has as much reality as your hunger has. But what is the criterion for truth? That which is ever the same, which can never be negated. All of these are, I mean, relative. Hunger is relative, thirst is relative, food is relative, everything is relative. Meaning, it exists in a certain time, certain place, certain conditions, but not at all the times, not at all the places, not all the conditions. In short, everything has a dependent reality. Everything is because of something else. The cloth is because of fiber, cotton. The cotton is because of fiber. The fiber is because of molecule. The molecule is because of atom. Atom is because of subatomic particles, whatever. Thus, everything is because of something else. So if you ask, what is this thing? What is that I am wrapping around my body? Swami, that is a cloth. Really? To me it looks like cotton. That also can be said because it is cotton also. So is it cloth or cotton? Well, cotton is more real than cloth, I guess. But somebody says, no, no, Swami, I see only fibers there. That also is true because cotton is fiber. So no, Swami, I see only molecules there. So what is this? When you ask the question, what is a given thing? Then to call it cloth is only a standpoint. It is not the absolute definition of what this is because from a different standpoint, this looks different. So whatever there is in the world is subject to a variety of definitions depending on the standpoint. And how an end looks at it, I don't even know. You know, for an end it may be something else. For a little worm it may be yet another thing. And thus, everything is only subject to standpoints. The definition that we give, the names that we assign, the concepts that we entertain are all standpoints. It's all what we call relative reality, dependent reality, changing reality. Everything is in effect depending upon its own cause. If the cause is not there, the effect is not there. In case of this part, if the clay is not there, the part is not there. Therefore, part has a dependent reality. So Chanda Upanishad says, part is mithya, is apparent, is unreal. The clay is real. Of course, you can say clay also is unreal, earth is real. There is unreal, molecules are real. And thus, if you keep on deducing it to its fundamental cause, where will it ultimately land? Where will it ultimately resolve into? Where do you think will it resolve into? If you take such a thing as a part and resolve into this cause and cause into further cause and that into further cause, as the scientists do, this process will lead you to what? It will lead to the most fundamental cause, which is not an effect, which cannot be further reduced. It will lead us to the irreducible substratum. What do you think is that irreducible substratum? So the truth of the part is clay. Truth of the clay, clay is earth. Truth of the earth is molecules and so forth. What do you think is the fundamental truth which cannot be further reduced? Energy. Energy. Awareness. Huh? Awareness. Awareness. With reference to what we are discussing, Atma Satyam Tadanyat Saram Mithya, it is Atma the Self. Ultimately, even we will find that this part also ultimately depends upon the self. Call it awareness or call it existence or call it, but everything ultimately will reduce to what we call Atma or the self. Everything else, Tadanyat everything else is dependent. Only independent reality is Atma or the self. Everything else is dependent reality. 
So now the real Vedanta begins. So far was all background. It was not Vedanta. It was all Karma Yoga and some Vedantic texts need not have this. So many Vedantic texts don't spend much time with all this qualification etc. Thank God that they did so that we had the opportunity to discuss them. But otherwise, this is Vedanta. Tattva Veka Kaha what is this, what is the discrimination between, uh, what is discriminating knowledge of the truth? Atma satyam tadanya saram mithya. Atma is truth, everything else is apparent or unreal. Okay, we'll continue tomorrow. Om Purnamadaf Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Vadarayanam Sutra Bhashya Krutovande Bhagavanta Punaf Punaha Ishvaro Guru Ratmeti Murti Veda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadvyakta Dehaya Lakshina Murtaye Namaha Om Shanti 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 Hari Om